The GPU performance of the M1 Max in the 14-inch MacBook Pro is lower than in the 16-inch MacBook Pro. People have speculated that this is a thermal limitation due to the smaller cooling system. But is this really a thermal limitation? Can we do some cold weather testing to find out? Let's get into it. In my previous video, I showed the performance of the M1 Max versus the RTX 3080, both laptop and desktop. And the performance of the M1 Max in the 14-inch chassis is clearly lower than the M1 Max in the 16-inch chassis. Some people have stated that this is a thermal limitation of the smaller 14-inch MacBook Pro. But I'm not convinced. When I did my CPU testing in part 2, the temps of the CPU under load would spike over 100 degrees Celsius and then, as the fans kicked up, would settle down to 100 C. On Intel based Macs, the 100 degrees Celsius was a limit that, if exceeded, would result in thermal throttling where the CPU performance was severely reduced. That is not the case with these M1 chips and you see them maintain their performance even when temps go over 100 C. However, when I did stress testing of only the GPU, the temps would rarely exceed low to mid 90s and the fans would adjust to keep the GPU temps closer to 90 C. So I began to wonder, why do the fans adjust to control the temps of the CPU under load to around 100 C, but when the GPU is under load, the fans would adjust to keep the GPU temp to 90 C? It's an SOC. The CPU and GPU are on the same piece of silicon. Why are there two different temperature targets? Why wouldn't the GPU also have a temperature target of 100 C? So it got me thinking. What would happen if I removed the temperature limitation? If you've watched the channel from the beginning, you know that I've gone to extreme methods to understand how removing thermal limits can increase Mac performance. I did this testing on my 2018 Intel-based i7 Mac Mini to understand how much more performance could be achieved and based on those learnings, was able to recover about 10% more performance even while using it indoors in my office. And since the weather was appropriate, why not do it again? Now a word of caution. I do not recommend anyone to do testing such as this. Testing like this could result having water inside of your expensive MacBook Pro and permanent damage could occur. Again, I do not recommend you do this testing unless you know what you are doing. It was a cold day at minus 5C and to ensure maximum cooling, I put the fans up to the maximum speed and you can see the trackpad temp sensor is showing just one degree Celsius. When I ran the 3DMark Wildlife benchmark indoors, it achieved 100.1 frames per second. When I ran the 3DMark Wildlife benchmark outside in the cold, the resulting score went up to 105.2 frames per second. That is only an improvement of just 5.1% and still falls far short of the M1 Max in the 16-inch MacBook Pro by 14.8%. I then ran a 3 d Mark Wildlife stress test outdoors in the cold. This test is 20 minutes long and it was more than enough time to allow the temperatures to stabilize. You can see that the temperature of the four GPU clusters max out in the low to middle 60s Celsius. There is clearly no temperature thermal limit occurring on the GPU temps outdoors. First, looking at the results of the stress test done indoors, you can see that the best score is the first run at 16,872 and the worst score is the last run at 15,633. If we translate that into frames per second, that equates to a drop of 7.4 frames per second. Comparing the stress test done outdoors, you can see that the best score is the first run at 17,635, and the worst score is the 15th loop at 17,087. That equates to a drop in frame rates of 3.3 FPS. So while the drop is not as large, there is still a drop. The drop in frame rates is reflected in the stability score that the 3D Mark stress test provides. The stability score is nothing more than the lowest score divided by your highest score and then converted to a percentage. Ideally, the highest and lowest score would be the same, meaning no loss in frame rates from run to run, with a resulting score of 100%. So the closer to 100%, the better the score. You can see that indoors, the M1 Max has more than a 7% difference with a score of 92.7%. Outdoors, the M1 Max stability improved to 96.9%. As a comparison, when I tested the 14-inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro chip with the 16 GPU cores, it had essentially no variation at 99.7%. So with the variation between the M1 Max in the 14-inch MacBook Pro versus the 16-inch MacBook Pro, 
I started to wonder what variation you see from AMD and Nvidia when they have the same GPU die in a laptop and a desktop. Since 3 d Mark Wildlife is a native application for Apple Silicon, I decided to pull together the performance comparison of AMD and Nvidia GPUs. That will help us to understand the performance variations between constrained operation in laptops to unconstrained in a desktop GPU. To understand which GPU die applies to which product in laptop and desktop GPUs, please see my previous video on M1 Max GPU performance. Starting with AMD, the RX 6800M laptop GPU is 27% slower. The RX 6700 XT desktop is 38% faster. It uses the same die, Navi 22, as the 6800M, which really highlights the performance limitations of AMD's laptop GPUs. The power efficient desktop RX 6600 XT with a smaller die with Navi 23 is comparable to the M1 Max in the 14 inch MacBook Pro where the performance is to within 3%. Comparing the performance of current gen GPUs from Nvidia, the RTX 3060 uses the GA106 die. The RTX 3060 laptop is 2.2% slower while the 3060 desktop is 7% faster. Now the RTX 3070 uses the GA104 die, and the RTX 3070 laptop is 29% faster than the M1 Max in the 14 inch MacBook Pro, while the 3070 desktop is 70% faster. Now the RTX 3080 laptop GPU also uses the GA104 die and is 56% faster. From this we see that the RX 6700 XT is 91% faster than the same die 6800M laptop GPU. The 3070 desktop is 32% faster than the 3070 laptop GPU, and the M1 Max is 20% faster in the 16-inch MacBook Pro versus the 14-inch MacBook Pro. So AMD and Nvidia have even larger variation from unconstrained to constrained operation. Out of curiosity, I also wanted to understand just how the M1 Max compares to flagship desktop GPUs from previous generations. So I gathered the data and put together a chart showing how the efficient M1 Max compares to power-hungry flagship desktop GPUs from AMD and Nvidia. Starting with the previous desktop flagship GPUs from AMD, the R9 Nano, which was an efficient version of the R9 Fury chip at just 175 watts, is 40% slower. The Vega 64 is 9.5% slower. The Radeon 7 is 10.4% faster and the RX 5700 XT, while not technically a flagship, is the RDNA 1 flagship and is 10% faster. Then looking at the previous desktop flagship GPUs from Nvidia, the GTX 980 Ti is 29% slower, the GTX 1080 Ti is 20% faster, and the RTX 2080 Ti is 75% faster. Just for fun, how do present flagship GPUs compare? First, let's reset the scale, and the RX 6900 XT is 238% faster, and the RTX 3090 is 262% faster. The M1 Max performance will need to more than double to get close to current gen desktop GPUs. Now getting back to the lower performance of the M1 Max in the 14 inch MacBook Pro, we just saw that it is not a thermal limitation. All of the temps we saw were lower than 70 degrees C. So why the performance limitation? I dug deeper and looked at the second by second data to confirm that the frequency of operation and I found something interesting. When the 3D Mark test begins, the frequency is actually up to the maximum for the M1 Max. However, after about 8 seconds, the frequency drops more than 20% to just over 1000 MHz or 1 GHz. As the test continues, it will also then drop to the 900 MHz range. But as we saw, if this isn't temperature that is bringing down the frequency, what is it? I continued to pour over the data I collected, which included other stress tests where both the CPU and GPU were under max load, and one number kept showing up, and that was the number 45. As I went through the data, no matter what was happening, once you get beyond the first 8 seconds of any combination of CPU and GPU load, and the frequency sort of settled in, you see that the package power always running around 45 watts. So the only conclusion you can draw is that the M1 Max in the 14 inch MacBook Pro has a 45 watt power limit. That means the power supply in the 14 inch MacBook Pro can only supply up to 45 watts of power long term.
It can boost for short periods of time, but it will always reduce down to this limit. And based on this testing, we can definitively say that the M1 Max in the 14-inch MacBook Pro is not thermally limited, it is power limited. The engineers at Apple obviously know that the 14-inch MacBook Pro is not capable of providing the same performance as in the 16-inch MacBook Pro. Its power supply is not as capable. The hardware design is limited. You will get 10-20% to 20 lower performance. However, you will pay the same price for the M1 Max upgrade in the 14-inch MacBook Pro as you will in the 16-inch MacBook Pro. So the performance per dollar and value will be lower in the 14-inch MacBook Pro. I would have been fine with this if Apple would have mentioned this somewhere. At a minimum, they should have followed their convention and labeled the M1 Max GPU performance charts with up to this level of performance, depending on which size MacBook Pro chassis you select. Let me be clear. I don't have a problem with the lower performance in the smaller 14-inch MacBook Pro. What I have a problem with is Apple not communicating the lower performance. To me, it feels a bit like a bait and switch. When you spend $4,000 on a laptop with a company, you expect better. At least I do. I hope you found this information useful. If you'd like to see more, like, share, subscribe. Check out one of these videos for a more detailed look at M1 Pro and M1 Max. Thank you all so very much for watching. Stay safe, and I will see you in the next one.